everyone. Thank you for joining Japan Foundation London's online event. My name is Junko Takekawa, Senior Arts Program Officer of Japan Foundation London. The London Design Biennale just opened its doors on 1st of June, and I'm delighted to see a Japanese architect, Hirano Toshiki, represent Japan thanks to the vision of curator Claire Farrell, who almost single handedly planned and presented Japan's section. In 2016, we, the Japan Foundation, actually brought an exhibition from Japan, but couldn't continue to do so. Therefore, we were so honored to be able to come back to the Design Biennale, even as one of the financial supporters. It must have been so difficult to organize anything under the current circumstances, and that I wish all of those who have been involved in the project well. However, for today, it is not just, just about the Biennale, but it is about Mr. Hirano's architectural practice in general, and explore the idea of his new aesthetics and the architectural language. I would therefore like to welcome Mr. Hirano Toshiki, one of the most promising architects from the younger generation in Japan, and then lecturer at the Tokyo University to share his practices and idea. So even if you have some part isn't directly about the Biennale, you'll be able to understand what he has been aiming to present behind the interesting installation. After the brief presentation by Mr. Hirano, he will be joining a further discussion with Deborah Lopez, who is a licensed architect in Spain, a teaching lecturer at the Bartlett UCL in London, as well as Sarah Mineko Ichioka, who leads the discussion I have known Sarah since she was director of Architectural Foundation in London, and then I have full trust in her delivering an insightful discussion. Both Deborah and Sarah have a solid curatorial career in the international biennales, so this event is timely as well as relevant in this regard. I hope through today's event, you will be able to take away something regardless of your knowledge of architecture. Next, housekeeping matters. Today's event will be recorded. As we are using in a webinar function, your names will not be viewable by other attendees. However, I strongly recommend you to keep your audio and video muted throughout, just in case. If you have any questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function. At the bottom of that, uh, your screen, there is a Q&A function uh, marks there to send in your question at any time. Remember the attendees' questions may be seen by everyone else so that you can upvote a particular question placed by another person which you would like to answer or if it is the same as yours. Simply click the thumb up icon next to the question you wish to upvote. Unfortunately, due to time restrictions, you may not be able to pick up all the questions you asked. So my approach is in advance. Lastly, as always, we will send you an online questionnaire, so please spare a short moment to complete it for a future event. That's all from me. Now, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Hirano to start his presentation. Hirano-san, um, Thank you, Takekawa-san, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you, Sarah and Deborah, for taking your time to join this talk. And also, um, thank you, everyone behind uh, the screen uh, to join this talk. Um, well, uh, good evening from Tokyo and well, maybe like good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm connecting from Tokyo and as um, Takekawa-san introduced, I'm an um, uh, architecture designer based in Tokyo and I'm also teaching at uh, the University of Tokyo and serve as the uh, co-director of this uh, new platform uh, established last year uh, by Kengo Kuma uh, Sekisui House Kuma Lab uh, together with uh, my colleague uh, Sen Kwan. Um, and let me just start sharing the screen. All right, uh, okay. So let's get started. Um, so um, the title of today's talk um, has been set as the pursuit of new aesthetics, um, which I found is so grand and I'm a bit overwhelmed. 
uh, to be honest. And I don't think, um, you know, I can get uh, to the point where I say, let's say like, here's the five principles of new aesthetics of architecture in the future, uh, just like, you know, Luc Corbusier did in his book. Um, so my talk will be more or less about like showing my struggles of working with this concept of aesthetics. And talking about uh, why I'm interested in this topic of aesthetics is that because I think that there has been a dominating idea that uh, the performance uh, precedes the aesthetics in architecture, especially since the, the digital technology was introduced in architecture uh, in the mid of 90s. And when we talk about performance here, um, it is about how energy efficient you can design your building or um, how to rationalize complex form with the use of the digital technology. And aesthetics is something which comes after those performance factors. And of course, I mean, performance in architecture is important, um, especially in terms of sustainability. Uh, however, my argument is that aesthetics is equally uh, important and we cannot reduce architecture into a set of uh, performance rates, um, like, you know, uh, lead points or whatever. And I think like in, there is an emerging generation uh, who shares this kind of idea. Um, so, I mean, like, you know, today's guests, um, Deborah and her partner, Hadi, uh, will be like, you know, one of the, the colleagues uh, who shares this kind of idea, I believe. And uh, in the year of 2017, um, I picked up groups of those people uh, when like I served as a guest editor uh, for one of the issues of A Plus U magazine, uh, which is an international architecture magazine uh, based in Japan. And as I said, uh, currently I'm teaching at the University of Tokyo and I have been trying not to separate uh, what I teach from what I do um, in my practice. Uh, so, uh, here uh, you see like, you know, my design studios brief um, titled uh, Towards New Aesthetics of Architecture. And I work with my students and we investigate uh, this issue of um, aesthetics in different sites and programs. Uh, so here um, is a studio brief of the undergraduate studio I taught uh, in which uh, we designed uh, single family houses. Um, we started from the hypothesis that uh, the aesthetics in architecture uh, since modernism has been uh, based on how to compress the uh, amount of information you handle uh, in the design process. So uh, for example, uh, industrialized building materials uh, that are uh, dominant in today's building industry, uh, for example, like H beams or engineered woods, uh, those are um, identical in terms of uh, sizes or structure performances. And uh, because of that, uh, this reduces factors that you need to take account uh, during the design process. So there's this kind of uh, aesthetics of uh, minimized information or aesthetics of compression um, has been dominating. Um, based on that uh, tech, uh, more like a technological uh, limitation. And however, um, we can handle um, vast amount of information today, uh, thanks to the digital technology. And for example, like 3D scanning technology allows you to take in complex physical objects into a digital model with millions of meshes. And then you can handle, you can manipulate um, and then actually kind of bring back to the physical object after processing uh, digitally. So in this studio, we questioned um, what the aesthetics without compression or aesthetics of vast amount of information is. And we were interested in like rocks um, as a starting point of the design. And uh, that's because rocks are um, everywhere and we don't usually pay attention um, in our daily lives. 
but um, each of them, each of rocks has a rich amount of information. So like there are bumps, like different materials, different colors, and then like it's so multifaceted. So like it has like a really rich, diverse like amount of information. And well, um, this is a rock which people pay attention uh, in Contrary, uh, but it is um, jade rock uh, in Yu Garden in Shanghai. And um, this highly complex rock uh, was uh, formed by um, erosion process over countless years. And it somehow kind of resists any compressions and abstractions. So we try to kind of um, create something which resists any compressions or abstraction and pursue this aesthetics of um, vast amount of information in the studio. So in the studio, um, I asked my students to pick up random rocks around them um, and 3D scan the rocks and develop their own drawing and model making techniques uh, to represent the rocks uh, they chose. And then I asked them to apply that techniques to modernist masterpiece houses and transform them uh, into the, uh, their own design. So uh, this is one of the, the students and she was interested in that uh, her rock contains different grains and she developed a representation technique to kind of exaggerate that uh, characteristics. And then she came up with a critique uh, by making Fansworth's house known for its transparency into an even more transparent container, revealing its hidden plumbing pipes and electric wires, and developed this idea of container uh, to design a house. So um, this is just like one example from um, what I did in the studio. studio. And now I'm moving into showing some of the projects from my practice. And I want to show the projects based on my interest to an idea of holes or hollowness, uh, which has been one of the driving forces for my projects. And before like actually moving to like showing my projects images, um, let me like introduce some of the inspirations behind the concepts of holes and hollowness. So um, this is a quote from Fr French philosopher uh, Roland Balf, Empire of Science. And Balf had traveled to Japan, including Tokyo uh, during the 60s and made lots of interesting observation on Japanese cities and cultures, uh, including this one, uh, which is uh, published in his book, Empire of Science. And he describes that the structure of the city of Tokyo um, has a imperial palace as a center but the center itself is a void and the void is not accessible and contains some kind of like mystery. And there's another French uh, philosopher I admire and this is uh, George Bataille. And I won't go into the details uh, since it's running out of time, uh, but there's an essay by him on a work by this uh, French philosopher, uh, not philosopher, photographer, uh, Andre, um, Boisfort, uh, titled uh, Mouth. And what is interesting about this piece uh, is that we see something more than the mouth as a whole, which takes the air and food. So the mouth cannot be fully understood by its performance, but there's uh, some kind of um, uncanny quality uh, within itself. So uh, without, um, so like inspired by those ideas, uh, my works can be described as a project uh, to investigate the possibility of architectural holes. And when we talk about holes in buildings, um, it is usually about, let's say like windows or uh, doors uh, and they are understood by their performances like letting air, uh, light or people in and out. Um, but I want to uh, pursue is uh, something that make the, the building um, uncanny 
and make people feel um, as if the building has its own kind of ecosystem within itself. And here's like, you know, one of the examples of um, those kind of uh, experimentations. And this is a uh, installation artwork I did for an um, exhibition held in Tokyo uh, almost five years ago or something. And um, it is a series of kind of creature-like units that have holes framed by stainless steel miller and covered by fake fur or um, synthetic gravel uh, painted in silver. So those textures um, somewhat emphasizes this um, uncanniness of the holes and uh, the stainless steel frames uh, reflect uh, people looking at them and allures, allures uh, them into the holes. And um, not only like an art installation work, but um, I've been experimenting uh, this idea in like designs of actual buildings in different scales. Um, and this one is a proposal for a, a kiosk in Chicago. And this is a proposal for a museum in Finland. Um, of course, holes uh, function as skylights to take in natural lights here, but my focus is to use holes to make the building alert uh, to creatureness, um, so to speak. And this one is a visitor center in the conservation area in Abu Dhabi. Um, and as you see here, uh, same as the previous uh, project, uh, the building is made out of the, the collection of uh, trapezoidal units uh, that have holes in various angles. And there is a larger void in the middle of the building as a courtyard. And inside the courtyard, uh, there's a tower, uh, but it is for taking the wind into the building, so it's hollowed. So again, like um, hole within the hole kind of uh, nesting relationship is kind of happening uh, inside the building. Um, some like interior views. And um, this is a proposal for a public toilet I did uh, last year. And I experimented with different ways of creating holes in this project, uh, comparing, comparing to the, uh, the previous um, projects I showed. And each hole um, leads to uh, different uh, cubicles. Um, and so like, yeah, this, this might be like, you know, uh, easier to understand uh, the composition of the building. But um, if you look at the, uh, the floor plan, uh, you see that uh, this U-shaped uh, floor is divided into seven cubicles, uh, different scales and functions. So um, there's like, um, you know, like uh, men's bathroom and then like other cubicles are all, um, uh, all universal, like all, for all genders. And then each cubicle has different uh, size and some, uh, some cubicle has like baby bed, some cubicle is like a, um, you know, like wheel wheelchair um, accessible. So like it somehow kind of contains this diverse range of needs uh, in public toilet. Um, and then like a through like, you know, multiple holes, uh, so to speak. And finally, um, the last project I want to show um, is an installation for Japan Pavilion at London Design Biennale 2021, uh, titled uh, Rebenting Texture, uh, curated by uh, Claire Farrell, as Junko mentioned. And this just begun from this Monday at Somerset House in London. And in this project, um, I'm revisiting the series of works by this um, Japanese artist, Makabe Tomoharu, um, titled uh, Urban Fortage. And Makabe explored around the city of Tokyo in the 70s and placed sheets of paper on different surfaces and rubbed them uh, by a pencil to transfer textures of those surfaces. And we can read his works as an attempt um, to capture what the city is. 
And what is interesting in this technique of frottage is that it somehow resonates with uh, the boss idea of hollowness. So uh, you see textures of objects uh, transferred on the paper, but actually the objects themselves are not existing uh, behind the paper and there is only a void, uh, but it somehow kind of alludes uh, to what was behind. Oops. Oh, sorry. So um, since the pandemic uh, hit Tokyo um, in the spring of 2020, I have been stuck in Tokyo and couldn't travel outside. So um, I took this opportunity to explore around the city of Tokyo and collect elements of the city just like Makabe did. Uh, but uh, in my case, like instead of bringing paper and pencil, um, I utilized the, the 3D scanning technology uh, called photogrammetry. And here are some of the objects I scanned ranging from a pack of sushi, a vending machine uh, to a high res office building. And I also worked with students at Royal College of Art uh, to scan objects in London. So I couldn't travel to London. So I asked students to um, like collect, uh, explore around the city of London and collect uh, different kinds of elements. And what is really interesting about the, the 3D scanning technique is that you can only like scan a surface of an object, just like you know, the frottage uh, does. Uh, so you, you cannot like you know, scan the, the the, the interior of the object. So scanned models are all um, hollowed um, in some sense. And after that, like, you know, scanned models were digitally scaled and deformed, then collaged into an eight meter long wall relief. And here's a screenshot of the website, um, which is just opened. So, um, like, you know, this is the, the website. And then as you see, like, you know, um, like you can see the, the elevation of the 3D model of the wall relief. And what is, what I found it quite interesting uh, is that I didn't like, you know, really intention um, this, well, uh, intended to kind of um, like imitate this, but it almost, as if like, you know, you are looking at um, Hyakkiyako scroll, like, you know, this um, scroll of like night parade of 100 demons um, in Japan. So, um, well, I mean, like, you know, this is not intentional at all, but like, you know, I found it quite interesting, um, somehow kind of resonate, uh, resonating with like, you know, um, kind of Japanese traditional idea of animism. Any case. Uh, so the digital model was curved out into like 12 styrofoam panels, uh, CNC milled, and then the panel uh, were used as a formwork uh, for papier mache or uh, in Japanese hariko. So I hand pasted patches of Japanese paper uh, soaked in glue uh, on the formwork and uh, detached the paper layer from the, the formwork. So again, the, the relief becomes hollow inside. So yeah, just like this. And uh, here are some close-up views of the relief. So like, you know, you can read some of the objects, but like, you know, you cannot. So there's like a really interesting kind of um, push back and forth between kind of readability and um, so to speak, like unreadability. Um, and now um, 
it is installed in Somerset House. And as you see, like, you know, the relief uh, is curving along three sides wall in the relief. And then there's a projection and then there's the sound uh, element. So it's really fully immersive. And if you're watching uh, from, um, from the UK or if you're traveling to um, London in June, um, please like pay a visit uh, to London Design Biennale. All right, uh, thank you. And that's it uh, from my side. And now we are moving into the round table discussion. So I will pass the microphone podium to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Hirona san for that presentation. Uh, good evening from Singapore, everyone. Uh, and a warm thank you to Takakawa san and her colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be able to reconnect with the Japan Foundation and uh, with London, uh, both of which hold very uh, warm places in my heart. So um, we strongly encourage participation in tonight's conversation. Uh, I think we have people calling in from all over the world. As Japan Foundation colleagues have already reminded, please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A with your name, and we'll try to get through as many of them as possible as time allows. Um, however, I would like to take a moderator's prerogative and pose a few starting questions uh, to Hirono san and also to Ms. Lopez or Toshiki and Deborah, if I may. Um, it was a fascinating uh, presentation and it's uh, adds such a different dimension to uh, my understanding of the project, having seen it in the context of your research at the university, as well as your um, gallery, your, your um, design competition proposals. And I wondered, um, if we could refer back to the A plus U magazine that you guess edited in 2017, uh, there was a passage that uh, really caught my imagination in your introduction, uh, where you wrote, continuity remains a central preoccupation of contemporary architecture. However, as related elsewhere in the essay, a state of disconnection has gradually become, begun to emerge in the years since 2000. And then you, you refer to how the young architects you featured, uh, your peers in many ways, um, respond to this idea of disconnection. Hmm. So reflecting on the global events of the last year and a half, right. um, I wondered if you could share with us how your thinking may have developed or evolved on this concept of disconnection shaping contemporary practices. Hmm. Thank you. I mean, thank you for the great question. Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, like I wrote that uh, this kind of uh, state of disconnection um, has been slowly emerging um, since the 2000 and became, it seems that like, you know, it became um, its height in the, uh, in the end of 2016, um, you know, when the, the the presidential election uh, was happened. Um, but like, yeah, like last, I mean, like, you know, since last year, we are uh, ex um, like, uh, we are witnessing like even more kind of disconnected situation, like physically disconnected uh, with each other. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, like, you know, this will um, uh, surely affect uh, our uh, ideas of how um, the aesthetics is uh, so my my, um, my take on aesthetics is that aesthetics in architecture or like well, aesthetics in any form is not something like you know purely autonomous or um, something which is independent from anything, but something like you know um, which is kind of uh, affected by other uh, situations. So like worldview or culture, you know, situation, whatever. So. Um, so like, you know, kind of seeking or explored pursuing uh, for new aesthetics is, I think it's a, it's a one way of understanding what the, the current world is and then what the, the world of the future will be. So I think like, you know, um, kind of like um, people around our generation started focusing on um, aesthetics is 
somewhat motivated by this kind of idea that aesthetics is not something like in you know, purely um, uh, autonomous, but something uh, it's about really understanding the, the word, what the word is. So at youth, I mean, you mentioned Trump, the Trump election as a key social marker globally, and that is often affiliated in people's minds as you know, a signal of a retreat away from globalization. Hmm. And I wondered how, if you could share with us more about how uh, your concept of aesthetics relates specifically to place. And um, you, you know, it's really, really inspiring when you were talking about your recent project collecting elements of the city. Um, but then what I wondered how you saw that translating over to the forms of the the building scale projects that you design. Right, right. So um, yes, the, the, you know, the, the local and global, or I would like replace like, let's say like sites, uh, the issue of uh, site specificity is something like, you know, which is um, pretty important in the, the discourse of architecture, discipline of architecture. And like, you know, there's like, Again, like you know, there's a constant push back and forth between like um, kind of like uh, local and global uh, in the discourse of architecture. So sometimes, like you know, we argue for like uh, locally specific kind of design methodology, uh, whereas like you know, sometimes we kind of pursue for kind of universal principles of uh, design. And yeah, it's like really interesting. So like you know, the the, the project. Uh, for the London Design Biennale, it's like really um, site specific um, in terms that like, you know, I, uh, like half of the elements are collected uh, in Tokyo. So like, you know, there should be something like re which represents kind of locality. Um, but um, I'm not like, you know, really fully on that side, like, you know, kind of everything has to be kind of locally specific. Um, which is like, I think it's a withdrawal from like a you know, global context. So I, I mean, like, and I'm trying to, I'm always trying to like somehow like preserve or kind of uh, contain this kind of dynamism, like, you know, this pushing back and forth kind of dynamism within like, you know, each project. So uh, in this case, like, you know, um, well, it happened co by coincidence, but um, you know, we had um, scanned elements from London collage into like, you know, the elements of Tokyo. So there's like a really interesting kind of, you know, push back and forth, like, you know, this kind of dynamism between like uh, the London and Tokyo. And then that's something like I found it quite interesting about um, this project. So it's not, again, like, you know, it's not like, you know, fully um, uh, homogeneous in terms of the 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 places uh, which I collected elements, but there's like you know kind of uh, different um, uh, places within this like you know whole within whole. So it's not like you know fully continuous, but somehow disconnected. But it's not fully disconnected. This kind of like you know in the middle uh, condition is something I I always found it interesting. Thank you for that. Um... In the context of the London Design Biennale, um, and I'm so glad that we have the curator Claire, Claire Farrow here with us uh, this evening. I understand that you and uh, Ms. Farrow uh, first developed a working friendship uh, when you were involved in uh, the Kengokuma installation in a previous iteration of Biennale. Um, and given that context and the fact that I know uh, Deborah's firm has work currently on display in the Spanish pavilion at the Venice Biennale and has also exhibited at, at numerous international contexts such as the Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism. I wondered if we could take some time in discussing um, what seems to be in all of the reviews of Venice this year, which is in the context of a pandemic, what does a international exhibition mean anymore and many people have been taking the opportunity to stick the knife in and say that it's completely irrelevant. Um, I would like to be more optimistic than that, but I would also love to hear your thoughts and um, Deborah what what 
what's your view on the current state of play of international exhibitions of architecture and design? How do they relate to the development of your practice? And what are your uh, hopes for them going forward? Well, I have to say that uh, coming from a year of completely isolation, you know, uh, the, the fact of going to Venice and like have the possibility to be in contact with so many people, it was like really refreshing. Like really, like, I don't think I took it like, uh, I, I think it before we were taking it as granted. Whereas right now, like having this possibility to be together, to share, like, because we have, like when you guys were talking about disconnection and connection, I thought like, yes, we are physically disconnected, but I have never been so connected since the last year, right? But it's not the same at the same time, right? But um, I mean, coming from Venice, I think that the questions that have been placed are extremely political and like uh, quite relevant. And I'm, I'm really wondering like uh, with, the, with the conversation that we are having here, like how um, the connection between this kind of aesthetics or like, I mean, even I was wondering now with the question that Toshiki was presenting at the very beginning, performance versus aesthetics, it's kind of funny, but uh, when I was preparing this, uh, like putting my thoughts together for today, the first question I wrote in my in my thing it was performance, and then the next one was not aesthetics. The next one was affection. No, like I think that aesthetics have like a capacity to somehow embrace with certain qualities that are related to empathy, to tactility, to affection that um, probably we have been taking for granted, and and be related back to the exhibitions that suddenly become extremely relevant in the context when we have physical interactions. So going back to your question, like uh, I, I think that the Biennale is like, it kind of seems like a peregrination or like a kind of route that you have to follow every year, every two years to different places. I understand the points of like, that they don't have any sense or any means, but at the same time, I think that it is a really good way to somehow put together the stage of the discipline question it and to somehow like share moments of togetherness, like probably to group, group people that probably have no much in common, but there's there's a dialogue in it. So Shiki, do you have thoughts oh. about? <laughs> yeah, like, I think it's pretty interesting, like you know, your observation. So I think like, you know, well, I think like, I can't remember which year was that, but um, there was, I think like it was, um, American Pavilion at Venice Biennale in, I don't know, like 2016 or something, uh, titled like, you know, stock, uh, taking a stock, stock taking or something. So I think like, you know, what is really interesting about Venice Biennale or like, you know, this kind of, you know, like world-class like um, Biennale event is that it's somehow kind of, um, it's like a stock taking of like, you know, what has been done uh, globally in that discipline. So it's like really nice way to like really reflect back um, and summarize what has been done and then like move to move forward. So um, yeah, this kind of like really, you know, um, coming together and then sharing thoughts is like a really nice thing. And then, well, any case, um, uh, going back to this, um, you know, the your question, uh, question or your remark on like affection. Yes, I mean, this is something I think like, you know, uh, we are uh, shared in common as an interest. So I guess like, you know, in your case, um, um, like, like, you know, in your, in your Spanish pavilion, you were show, displaying this um, object uh, covered with uh, hair. And that's certainly like, you know, about the, you know, affection. So like hair is, of course, I mean, like, you know, it's just a fiber, but it's something different from like any other fibers and it kind of allows like special kind of emotion to like, you know, the viewers. So sometimes like uh, people feel like, you know, kind of gross <laughs> by like, you know, <laughs> looking at the human hair, but sometimes like, you know, you have this kind of um, interesting kind of interaction, uh, emotion um, kind of, you know, like um, affected by that material. So yeah, that's something like, you know, I, I'm, I'm always like interested in, and then especially when I was working on the, this um, installation in Tokyo, uh, which I use like fake fur and then gravel. So, I mean, like, yeah, like there are a lot to like, you know, shared in common um, between us, but in any case, yeah. Yeah, but also like it's some somehow sorry, sorry, sorry. It it also poses like the this kind of idea of the object in for gallery where you cannot touch. 
but mm. suddenly that you can also like really interact with it. Like I remember mm -hmm. like in Tokyo where we were seeing Toshikis where like they were like directly to touch, you know, and it happened the same for us in Venice. Mm. Like everyone was asking, can I touch? By rules, <laughs> you cannot, but actually you are going to, right? So mm. it somehow poses questions to also the, the individuals and the behaviors and, and the, the, yeah, the behavior toward the object that we are exhibiting, which I like, I, I didn't mention it before, but I also find quite interesting the fact that uh, exhibitions like uh, Venice Biennale or Soviet Biennale give the opportunity to probably materialize certain, um, I would say objects or installations or ideas that wouldn't have uh, much other opportunities into like the professional practice per se, in the traditional sense, right? Like this object wouldn't have a way to be exhibited or the research that we have been conducting during the last years, unless this type of uh, event happens, right? So, um, and about that, I think that it also allows to somehow the discipline to evolve towards different realm that it is not, not only the, the conventional means of architecture. Thank you right. both. I want to take the opportunity to fold in a few questions from the audience, which have been coming fast and furious, but feel free to tie your continuing thoughts back into your responses to them. Um, from an anonymous attendee, uh, we have the question, what do you think about the potential power of the hollows or hollowness um, to combat disconnection? And for context, in suburban England, public hollows have been our main physical means of connection at a safe distance during the pandemic, both formal public spaces and less formal ones, such as alleyways, bus shelters, et cetera. Perhaps mm. you could give some examples from your experience of last year in Tokyo. Hmm. Interesting. Um, hmm. Let's see. Hmm. To combat this connection, right. So, yeah, I mean, like, whole, um, actually, I was like, you know, talking about the same topic um, last week in Tokyo, there was like, you know, um, the symposium and um, there was uh, Kengo Kuma uh, giving a lecture earlier, earlier, and he was uh, showing this um, VNA museum uh, in Dundee, UK, and where he had make he ha he made a hole um, to connect the city and uh, the river. I think it was a river, and uh, in that case, like you know, his kind of emphasis on whole was about like, you know, connection. So pure connection between the city and uh, the river. Uh, but um, my interest about whole is rather like a pure connection, but more about uh, this connection or uh, invisibility. So you cannot like really see uh, what's uh, behind the whole, what's like you know, beyond the whole clearly, but you feel there's something like, you know, um, which is um, alluded by the whole. So like you can sense something's happening. And then I think like, you know, this somehow kind of uh, heightens uh, people's kind of uh, year or uh, will to be connected. So in my case, it's not about uh, directly combating against the, the disconnection, but it's it's more like a indirect, it's like the way to kind of um, encourage or make people, um, you know, uh, like uh, long uh, to be connected um, by making the kind of partial or I don't know, quasi kind of disconnection. And it's kind of abstract, <laughs> but. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Professor Robert Brown, who I believe is going to be involved in an upcoming Japan Foundation event, if I'm not wrong. Um, his question is, your investigations would seem to be grounded in the finding of elements and of a revealing of their substance and sensuous haptic qualities, which inform the subsequent materiality of your building propositions. At the same time, many of your images were of interiors, which conveyed a sense of the ephem ephemeral and void. How do you understand the presence of that simultaneity? Is that simultaneity rooted in inherited Japanese sensibilities or is it more reflective of your own personal aesthetics? Hmm. Um, let's see. Hmm. 
Hmm, I see. So how Japanese are your aesthetics versus how, you know, Princeton or wherever else, you know, what other influences may have formed your unique sensibility? Mm. I know it's not my point, but I have to say that I have seen, um, while, I, while I was at the University of Tokyo, I saw mm -hmm. Toshiki's work since he was undergraduate student in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And there was some kind of dialogue, this obsession with the hollowness and so on. It was also coming from there, I believe. So I, I think even if I, he doesn't understand it in that way, and I'm sorry if I stop him, I think it has to be, before going to Princeton, he had his interest already. I see. I, I, am I wrong, Toshiki? No, no, I don't think. Well, actually, actually, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> I, I, it's really hard to understand, like, and sometimes why I'm thinking it this way. Like, you know, sometimes, like, you know, um, someone else understands better than you <laughs> so like you know yourself is like an equally like a you know, mysterious object in that sense <laughs> but yeah i mean like thank you for the, the nice observation but yeah right i mean like i think maybe yeah you're right like you know something like which is kind of i don't know like um brewed um since the the, the undergraduate era back in kyoto um but yeah I need to like and think about that. Yeah, but yeah, thank you for like, you know, the wonderful question, which I can kind of continue pondering upon. <laughs> now I have a very technical question, which has been very popular with a lot of the audience members who were intrigued by the technique that you used for uh, 3D scanning of the objects. And they're actually asking for a bit more detail on the technicalities of that. I think the, the capture of the imagery and then uh, the translation into your design. I see. I see. So I think like, you know, the, I mean, Deborah, um, I think like, you know, back in Tokyo, you worked um, kind of extensively, like, you know, with 3D scanning and how to utilize that uh, into the building um, kind of construction um, technology. And I think like you're familiar with, but um, in my case, like, you know, I, I use this technique called photogrammetry and then it's like, it's about like taking uh, pictures with any kinds of cameras, like, you know, iPhone is just fine. Um, or, um, uh, taking the picture of the object you want to scan from like an every angle. So you take, let's say like, you know, almost like 50 to 100 pictures um, in total for each object and like um, import uh, those pictures into the, the computer. And then there's like, you know, this specific software which processes, stitches all the images together and then reconstruct a 3D uh, model out of that. And I mean, like, actually this is not a new technology. It has been around uh, quite a long time. And then utilizing like archeology span or infrastructure, uh, civil engineering industry, uh, but um, it has been um, pretty difficult to like um, to use this technique because of the, the technical issue because like you know the computer wasn't that uh, wasn't fast enough but now like you know uh, recently you know the, the the processing speed of the computer has been significantly uh, increasing and this kind of technology becomes like much more like accessible uh, by anyone and actually like I think um, many like architect and then also like artists started like really investigating into this new kind of technique. Thank you. Um, now I know both of you are very actively involved in education. Uh, Deborah uh, uh, previously at Inda in Bangkok um, and um, now in London and uh, Toshiki in uh, University of Tokyo. And we have a question from a student in the audience, uh, I think representing a number of students who probably are tuning in today. Uh, but I wondered if perhaps you could answer it a bit more broadly in terms of your approach to pedagogy and the, um, the tools and the tools and the outlooks that you hope to instill in your students um, based on your understanding of the, the needs of practice today. Um, what, you know, what advice might you give 
to those students. Um, in this case, Charlotte is asking for unlocking their creative possibilities when starting a new project, but feel to inter interpret it, feel free to interpret it more broadly. Maybe Deborah, if you okay. want to go yeah, first. Yeah, sure. Um, well, in, in our case, um, previously teaching in India was like a completely different thing because we were teaching undergraduate students. Currently teaching at the Bartlett, we are in the VPRA program where we are heavily involved in technology. Um, we have been given fully liberty, like like freedom to like somehow to not understand technologies in the probably more traditional ways of doing it, like very much related to what Toshiki was explaining, uh, related probably to parameter CSM and so on. No? But um, what we have tried is to set up a methodology by which uh, the students are able to somehow understand a particular interest. In our case, we are set in a specific context, but I think that the methodology can be applied into many multiple places. Whereas like this kind of, we call it like decoding and recoding. Decoding, understanding that you are using a series of tools. In this case, what Toshiki will be doing like through photogrammetry allows you to understand the context in a very particular way, right? Uh, we, we can go through issues of uh, resolution, representation. But then when we move towards like the design aspect, like let's say the recoding, how you are understanding this information in order to recode it back, is like where the where the design happens, where like uh, the, let's say the creative aspect has to come. So I think that uh, a possible way of like, or an advice to give on a student is to try to develop personal uh, representation and understanding methods that have to be like somehow sincere or like honest with your own interest, but at the same time allows you to move forward. So in my particular case, I think the fact of being in Tokyo helped me a lot because I was very isolated. So I didn't have like this kind of judgmental perspective that probably the West is like most common, uh, like, yeah, like engage with. So that allowed for this kind of freedom, like or like personal view of looking into things. And I will say that that might be like a good advice uh, for students, whereas like being aware of things is really good. At some point when you have to produce, you also need to like some kind of like be concerned with your own, with your own interest and your own ways of doing things, looking at your own and trying to like push forward uh, some, some particular points of view, I think. Right, right. Like uh, locating yourself um, in the environment where you can do the self reflection is somewhat, I think like, and I agree that like, it's important uh, to really form your personal interest. And then I think that's something I experiment, uh, experienced in Kyoto. I mean, Kyoto is like pretty much like, you know, disconnected from uh, other parts of the, the, <laughs> the Japan, um, especially like, you know, Tokyo is like overly connected city, whereas Kyoto is like more everything's slow, everything's so dull. And then like, there's so much time to like really think about yourself. So that was like a really nice opportunity. And then um, I really like the, uh, uh, your concept of decoding and record, uh, recording, was it? Um, and then like, you know, decoding is something I also um, do here in my studio at the University of Tokyo. So it's like really like, you know, kind of uh, intentionally abusing or intentionally like misusing uh, technology. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, in my case, yeah, um, the, the, the studio I showed, like, you know, was about like, really like, you know, try to misuse the, the, the 3D scanning. So like, um, like intentionally take bad pictures and see how the model becomes <laughs> or like really like abusing the, the game engine um, and like create this kind of um, virtual um, like utopia within the game engine is something what I did uh, last year, uh, which I didn't show. But like, you know, this kind of decoding or misusing is something like really um, important and interesting because that kind of encourages students to uh, think out of the box. So uh, in my case, um, what is like really different from the schools outside Japan or especially schools in Western country uh, uh, here, at, uh, here in Japan, uh, most of the, the school of architecture um, is, uh, is like, you know, kind of located within this um, engineering department. So, you know, if you finish the program, you get the, you know, this degree of engineer, um, engineering. So, 
like there's this kind of I don't know like really um kind of stiff uh, understanding of how the 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 building should be designed uh, in the students, and then each student have like in a really specific kind of way of working, uh, really conventional way of working. So uh, in my role here at Todai um, is to like really encourage students to kind of you know get out of the box and then like you know play hard and <laughs> work out. Um, so I think like you know that's um, what I what I think is the most important in the pedagogy. Thank you both. Um, I wanted to bridge for, from the theme of some of your uh, your studios, your teaching studios uh, that connect us back into the urgent realities of our current world. Um, namely, uh, you've written that you want to explore the new aesthetics as a way to understand how the world will be, especially the world after the Anthropocene. And um, Deborah as well, I know that I, I understand that your work also relates to some of these questions. For example, your follicle installation, that Tushy has already referenced, the hair, based on hair, uh, certainly was a provocation about environmental toxicity and awareness, right? It was in sort of destabilized <laughs> um, aesthetic condition. I wonder if you could both briefly comment on how uh, you feel that your, your work around the uncanny and the confounding relates to this, the urgent conditions of the Anthropocene. Mm. Shall I, yeah, I go, okay. Oh yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that architecture is at the middle of so many things happening now, that the way in which, uh, that to somehow reject or neglect the issue of aesthetics and the power that can have uh, into the built environment and how the users or the citizens might feel, um, is, is probably uh, one less tool that we can use for our advantage. Um, in our case, we are like uh, heavily involved in what we would call an ecological agenda, but definitely very much interested on the ecological aesthetics or the possibility of aesthetics to somehow embed the one on the other. So uh, I, I also think that it has to do with the issues of resolution, of uh, issues of um, of behaviors, but not directly linked into a form generation, which is how it previously has, has been explored, I feel. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, not sure if I'm answering your question, but uh, from, from our perspective, the, the point is to somehow try to understand architecture as a discipline that is able to connect to, un, yes, not tangentially, but crossing completely multiple disciplines and is able to interact with it and understanding that the aesthetics either if it is uh, in the way that a supermarket is being organized and how it's like particularly placed in such a way that has an effect uh, or the different tools that an architect can be used in order to design a building somehow is linked together with a series of context and, and situations that are like very much related with our impact and our location and in the in the current situation that, that we have, like either the Anthropocene, the post-Anthropocene, or however we want to call it. Mm. Mm, interesting. Well, um, I'm not quite sure whether we have enough time, but um, yeah, like, I think like, you know, we can go back to the, the my first like you know, proposition of like uh, performance versus um, aesthetics in terms of this question. So um, like this, concept of um, Anthropocene is about um, the, how can I say, like um, this integration of the, the understanding that there is a clear boundary between uh, what is artificial and what is natural. And um, like, you know, before this, integ this integration, uh, when we cope like environmental issue, we can say like, you know, let's make building like really sustainable and let's get the lead platinum medal or whatever. <laughs> and then like we can make it sustainable and environmental friendly. Uh, but with this like, you know, kind of um, this integration of under conventional understanding of what is artificial and what is nature, you know, like even like if you talk about like environmental friendly or natural friendly, we, you know, we, we cannot really talk about single nature 
like there's no like you know single um, shared definition of what the nature is. So now like you know there's no like really um, uh, way to I I don't think like you know, there's a kind of certain way to kind of co tackle with this issue um, based on performance based uh, design approach. So in that sense, I think like a more uh, subjective um, kind of aesthetic approach uh, becomes more kind of uh, significant in this in this case. So that's something like you know I have been like working um, like you know since two years ago in the studio, which I didn't show, but um, it's about really like you know challenging this notion of uh, what is artificial, what is like natural, and then coming up with like you know um, new aesthetics by uh, designing the 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 utopia of the post anthropocene uh, was like you know what, what I did uh, for past two years. But in any case, I, I don't go into the detail. But yeah, that's my thought. Thank you so much. Since we haven't had time to um, answer all of the questions that the audience have generously shared, I wanted to invite uh, both of you to, if, if you feel comfortable, to uh, share any social media handles um, in the chat box um, so that. Uh, with all of the um, audience members um, in case people want to be able to follow up on, uh, keep track on the latest developments in your work. Um, thank you so much for your contributions. I, it was wonderful to discover midstream that you have known each other since your time as students in Kyoto. So it's great that you've, you've continued your, your professional bond as your careers uh, develop internationally. Um, and a big thank you to the Japan Foundation team, who I will now hand over to for closing remarks. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for those people who actually um, gather the question on the Q&A box. Um, as I said earlier, um, it was difficult to pick all of them uh, because of the time constraint. And then discussion, I first, as far as I actually believe that, Discussion went very well, and uh, it, it was really thought provoking and then, um, you know, revealing so many things for me as well, that particularly from the environment to technology and uh, education, discussing architecture has uh, so much dimension, so many dimensions to talk about, and also the so closely related to our life and the livelihood. And um, so that's, I sincerely hope that um, uh, such a discussion will continue, uh, if not with Japan Foundation for you know, beyond the Japan Foundation to, I mean, ideal world that uh, makes you know, our life better, of course, nonetheless, but whether it is possible or not, I'm not really sure. But um, um, thanks so much for those people who are joining us today using our lunchtime. And then uh, thanks to Hirano-san and then Deborah and then also that's a Sarah who conducted a perfect, really interesting in the discussion. I appreciate so much. So um, I think, uh, Darian, can you actually show that um, um, slide in that final slide? Yes. Yes, as I mentioned before in that uh, chat box, you can, you know, you will get to know more about that um, um, concepts and then um, whatever, you know, behind that. Um, Japan Room for uh, London Design Biennale. This website is created by, uh, this is the London Design Biennale you know, website. And then also in the chat box, you can see that uh, Hirano-san's, uh, Hirano-san's that um, uh, owns uh, website. Can you, Daria, can you share in the chat box? Oh yeah? Yeah. So that's, that's all from me. That's, yeah, there is a lot of sort of, you know, at Mark or Twitters and then um, Hirano-san's Twitter address there. If you want to ask some questions, just ask that, you know, Sarah and then Hirano-san by through that uh, Twitter channel. And then uh, that's all from me. And then as I said, um, Darian will send you that uh, questionnaire. Please um, um, uh, reply back to us, you know, what you thought about it. Otherwise, that's all for me. Thank you so much. Have a nice afternoon. It's glorious weather in, in, in London, at last. It's quite hot actually here. Yeah, I'm sweating a lot. Anyway, thank you so much and have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.